Miigwech, Buju Ginoa, and Dinoe Magani Dok, and Nich in Nishnabe, Nich Marzik, Bangietago in the Nita Nishnabe, and Kuchunjish Mayan, Giganos, and Dijnakas, Ne Ashimuniging and Donjaba, Nagik and Zodem, and the Kwech Biejayag Nungum. Thank you for this wonderful introduction to be able to have uh, Philip offer that opening uh, prayer, starting us off in a good way was very meaningful to me. And to hear from the Dean and her enthusiasm for what's happening is also very heartening. And uh, thank you to the Indigenous Law Students Association for inviting me. I've had an opportunity to come to this speaker series in person before, and I've always enjoyed my time uh, at the U of A. Um, I've been asked to tell some stories today, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Um, I am um, speaking to you today from the Lekwungen and, uh, and Sanchothan territory, um, and grateful to be here on the south part of Vancouver Island. But as I introduce myself, I'm from Nea Shiwadigaming and Donjaba, which is the Cape Croker Indian Reserve on the shores of Georgian Bay. And uh, the story I want to tell you. Uh, comes from this setting. And perhaps I'm just going to share my screen very briefly so that you can see some pictures of this uh, place so that when I tell a story, you might be able to situate it a little bit in your mind uh, from where I'm going to be speaking uh, about. And so here is, like I said, Neashi Wadingaming in Donjaba. This is the Cape Croker Indian Reserve. And um, mm -hmm. you can see the beautiful limestone escarpments, which rise up uh, out of the water in this part of the world. It's about three hours north of Toronto, four hours north of Detroit. All these shorelines are covered in fossils. If you were to pick up these rocks, you would see life from 440 million years ago when Ontario was at the equator. <laughs> the, the continent has drifted. Uh, uh, over the last 440 years, this used to be like the Great Barrier Reef. It was a warm, shallow sea. And so you can, see, if you walk along the shore here, you're just reminded of those older times with the shells and the um, plant life and the little swimmers that are embedded in the rock there. And of course, they're also up there on the escarpment. Those escarpments are the same escarpments that run up the backbone of Ontario um, through um, Niagara Falls, etc. And so this is where I love. <laughs> this is my home. Uh, we're talking about coming home again. Here's a, a look at it from outer space. Of course, here's Toronto. Here's my reserve. Here's Detroit down in this area. And it's just a fantastic part of the world. If you were to be, there's my clan, Nagigan Dodem, as I introduced myself earlier. Um, just surrounding us are all of these beautiful stars that are in the water, sorry, yes, that are actually in the water. At night, you see the reflection of them, but of course, they're up on high as well. These stories are in the sky, they're in the water, they're in the land, they're in the clouds, they're in the plants, they're in the animals. They're just, wherever you look, uh, you find opportunities to understand how to better relate to one another, to better relate to our children, and to find those places, this is my family now, find these places of connection. Um, there's me as a little boy. Um, as we go through the years, thinking about the possibilities of how beauty can inspire us to understand who we are and what we might do and how we might relate to one another and how we might encourage that next generation as uh, they come along to be as um, healthy, as happy, as beautiful as the world that surrounds us is. And so that's uh, just a few pictures there. Now for the story. Every September when it's not COVID, I usually go back to the reserve and I um, have law students join us for about four days at a time. So one weekend we'll have University of Toronto law students come. Another weekend it'll be students from the University of, uh, of, of Sir McGill University, another weekend, it could be Osgoode Hall Law School. And it's just wonderful to have them camp out on the land, get to meet our elders, get to hear about our history, get to hear about our laws. And our laws, of course, as we talk to the students, don't just come from legislatures and courts and 
um, premiers and prime ministers. Uh, they come from what surrounds us. They, they are functionally standards, principles, authority, criteria, measures, precedents, signposts, guideposts, their traditions, their resources for making decisions, that is for regulating our affairs and resolving our disputes. And so if you think about law in that way, we have lots to talk to the law students about uh, because so many of those standards, principles, authority, signposts, guideposts, measures, precedents, um, resources are just there every day. So it was a September morning and uh, I was running perhaps about uh, say six o'clock. And as I was running, the lake was there to the left of me. I could see that escarpment rising out of the lake. The sun was uh, coming up. And as the sun was coming up, I saw that the, um, the water that was on the grass, the dew was starting to, to, to um, evaporate. And so I felt like it was running through clouds as I was running across our prairie uh, just on this normal everyday run as these, uh, um, the sun was rising. Well, as I was running there, what I saw uh, maybe a couple of hundred meters in front of me surprised me because I saw the glint of metal behind some juniper bushes were, which were at the um, um, foot of Darlene Johnson's driveway. And I wondered what that was because I had not seen metal there in that place before. And as I drew closer, I recognized that what I was seeing was the barrel of a rifle, which was kind of disturbing to encounter that at six o'clock in the morning on this peaceful September day. And as I drew even closer, I saw there were two rifles and I saw a whole scene that was unfolding before me there. And I was worried. So I wondered what was going on, and then this story unfolded. About uh, 4.30 that morning, my cousin Nick Saunders had gotten ready to go out fishing. And of course, it was prior to the sun coming up, and he was with his friend, and he drove down that driveway to the shore, and he started preparing for the day. Um, and so he's you know getting his nets together, ensuring that they're going to be appropriately um, you know, able to be um, cast out that day, also filling the, the gas tanks, making sure that they were full so that it was on the water. If uh, his motor ran out, he'd have that kind of emergency uh, assistance. He was just basically getting ready for what promised to be a beautiful day. But as he was doing this, there was all sorts of commotion out in the water, huge splashing around, floundering around, and he wondered what it was. And he tried to see, right? He squinted his eyes into the dark, uh, but he couldn't really make out what was going on because the sun wasn't up yet. And he thought, oh, it must be a deer. Maybe it's a dog. And so he just went back to his work getting ready for the day. Uh, eventually, he set out with his boat, pushed off the shore. And uh, as he got off the shore, he pulled up beside the cause of this commotion. And he saw this big black object in the water. And so he and his friend reached over the side of the gunnels of the boat and they hauled up into the boat this 140 pound baby bear. But this baby bear had its head in a bucket. It was a very tight um, um, at the top of the bucket, and it was maybe about uh, maybe two to three feet high. And obviously, the bear had been in distress in the water, not able to see, not breathing very well, um, potentially with the water in the bucket uh, being you know close to drowning. And so they they brought this little bear on board, and they took it back to the shore. And in taking it back to the shore, they thought, oh, we need to do something. They haul it out of the boat. Uh, but of course, in doing so, the bear is frantic because someone is handling this little one and they don't know what's going on. And so they just dart off again. And this little bear takes off. And what it does is it takes straight off back into the water because it can't see. And it ends up putting its um, work into the water there. And it ends up where it was before. 
And so Nick and his friend think, oh, no, now what do we do? Um, well, they do the same thing that they did before. They launch out into the water, they pull up beside the bear, they haul it over the gunnels of the boat, they bring it back to shore. But this time they think, ah, we can't let what happened last time happen this time. And so what they do is they take some of that yellow rope, that almost nylon stretchy rope that you sometimes find uh, when you're working and fishing and whatnot, and they tie it around the bear's um, front um, arms around its torso. And so the bear is now got this rope around the front of its body, and then the bear is taken out in that way. Uh, but again, the bear is still frantic. So what does it do? This time it darts off, but it darts off down the shore. And as it's taking off down the shore, if you were probably looking at it from afar, it would look like Nick is taking his bear for a walk that morning. But he was really struggling because you saw the rocks there. You know, they're very flat. They're very uh, slippery, just one on top, top of another. And so he was trying to get his footing as he's trying to catch up with this bear that's pulling on this rope. And that was causing some difficulty, some grief for Nick to hold on. Uh, but then what happens is the bear turns, uh, turns left and it darts off into the bush. And that makes it now even more difficult because as Nick is trying to hold on, uh, now these branches are scratching at his eyes and his face and um, he's tripping over the roots on the ground that are there with the trees. And the bear is just barreling through, like bumping off different of those um, trunks as it's trying to make its way away from whatever was holding it from behind. Of course, Nick doesn't want to let go because the bear could easily get that rope tied up in a tree and be left to starve within that bucket. And so he doesn't, you know, doesn't want to just let it be. And so he continues to hold on. Eventually, Nick emerges from the bush and uh, the bear makes a dart for it, keeps running uh, until it gets exhausted. And where does it get exhausted? But at the foot of Darlene Johnson's driveway um, um, behind that juniper tree that I saw earlier in the morning. And it's just uh, exhausted. It's heaving, trying to breathe in that spot with this bucket over its head through all the trauma and challenge and uh, turmoil that it's gone through. Well, of course, uh, what had happened is uh, um, uh, when I got there, there were these two people with rifles. What had happened is Nick's friend had followed all along the way and had phoned our, our police officers on the reserve. Uh, we have our own tribal police and those two police officers, well known to the community, had been you know, working for 10 and 25 years, respectively. And they were there to protect uh, what uh, could you know, turn into a dangerous situation. But we didn't know what to do with this bear. Every once in a while, this bear would roll around um, in, in, the, in the dirt. It would pull against the rope. And we couldn't do anything to get close enough to be able to pull off the um, bucket off of the head of the bear. And so what did we do next? Um, as we were standing there, they called to the Ministry of Natural Resources, the Department of the Ontario Government. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they were an hour and a half away. And so they weren't going to be able to help in any quick way. They said they would come. And so we would expect they would eventually come, but we were left to our own devices still. So who was called next but Ashley? Ashley is the, was at the time the, the chief of the fire department. We have a voluntary fire department. He was a voluntary um, chief of this fire department. And so he brought his tools along. And in bringing his tools along, um, eventually, as this bear would go back and forth, Every once in a while, we'd think about what could be used to help. It was eventually decided that they would take some wire cutters that the um, fire chief had in his truck, and they started to work at the really thick, like thick, thick plastic 
at the neck of the, the bucket. And it took some time because the bear, of course, wouldn't hold still. But with effort, with resilience, with, with um, lots of work, eventually they were able to get the bucket free and off it came off of the head of the bear, which sounds like great success, which it was, except now you're holding a bear at the end of a rope with these huge teeth, right? So it's a dangerous situation. And with that danger, fortunately, that bear wanted to get as far away as possible from Nick, who was holding the rope, and from the rest of us that were standing there in that uh, crowd. At that point, my daughter, Lindsay, uh, comes along and kind of completes that group of people that was standing there, which was Nick and his friend, and myself and my daughter, and Ashley, uh, and the two police officers. So what do we do with this bear that's in this situation that is just, you know, beside itself. We can't let it go again because to let it go would be to let it run loose with this rope, which would risk um, putting this bear's life in danger. So there we were. And I'm hoping you're thinking about what does this have to do with law? What does this have to do with children? Well, remember law, is standards, principles, authority, criteria, precedent, tradition, resources for reasoning to help us regulate our affairs and resolve our disputes. And I want you to think about who does this bear represent? Because the next thing that unfolded in the story is someone pointed up towards the tree line and looking over to the tree line, what did we see? But a mother bear standing on her hind legs, sniffing around, trying to figure out what was going on off in the distance there. Right? So this uh, tension mounts as we're in this circumstance, all the while this little one is just in the dirt before us. Well, at some point, the bear um, takes his chances and it actually lunges towards Nick. And in lunging towards Nick, it actually grasps onto his leg uh, he has those big, thick fisherman's rubber boots on, but nevertheless, grass onto his legs and those teeth sink through those rubber boots, blunted though, fortunately, by the rubber boots. It does go into his flesh, but it just kind of in the um, top of his flesh makes a mark, but that hurts, right? He's been bit by a bear now, and he's got this bear on the end of the leech. What does he do? He still doesn't let go. He realizes to let it go is going to be challenging. It's going to be harmful for that little one. Fortunately, at this point, what happens is the bear finds this juniper tree. It climbs up the juniper tree. And then you can see its rib cage just going like this as it's uh, just full of adrenaline, full of trauma, full of panic. And it's trying to rest there out of what thinks it's harm's way uh, in the top of this small tree, which was only about maybe eight feet high. Well, by this time, time has passed, and there we are at the end of the driveway, and finally, the Ministry of Natural Resources shows up. And in showing up, uh, they, of course, see what we're all doing there, and they see this bear in the tree, and then they eyeball it to try to figure out what its weight is, what its size, what its age is, and they go back to their truck, and, uh, and they start pulling out to all of these chemicals, making this little potion that would tranquilize the bear. That's why they were called. We didn't have those kinds of tranquilizers on hand on the reserve. And so once they get that potion <laughs> all prepared, what they do is they put it on the end of a big, long um, uh, metal rod almost like a selfie stick, but it's about maybe eight feet long. And at the end of that rod, eight feet long, is a syringe. And in the end of that syringe, of course, is a needle. And so the bear is eventually coaxed down out of the tree, not happy about that. Again, rolls around for a little while, um, but eventually exhausts itself again. And so the Ministry of Natural Resources at that point goes up to the bear, pokes the bear, puts the tranquilizer into the bear, and it eventually 
falls asleep. And then in falling asleep, what's able to occur is the rope is able to be untied from around the chest of the bear. They put a tag in the bear's ear uh, in case they come across it again. Uh, my daughter, Lindsay uh, Gigata, actually gets to sit beside the bear, gets her picture taken with it uh, while it's sleeping like that. And then when it you know, wakes up groggily, eventually it runs off and uh, we have this situation where um, that's the day. And Lindsay and I ourselves then resume our morning run, we get back home, we shower, and uh, just a few minutes later, we find ourselves in front of the law students from one of those law schools ready to teach about Anishinaabe law, ready to teach about our own legal tradition. And thinking about this story helps me appreciate the living nature of Anishinaabe law, how law is found in our uh, communities. Now, as you know, it's often the case when um, we learn law, law comes from cases in the Western legal system. It comes from stories that are told to judges that are, that are done with the help of lawyers. And in this case, um, you don't have judges and lawyers telling a story. You have a story that just unfolded in the early morning on the land. And I would just generally leave that there as a story and say, there's our law. There's Anishinaabe law. And uh, I would ask you questions about how, how is that law? And, and what does that law mean? Well, how is it law? It's, it's law because you saw through the actions of all the characters, uh, the regulation of our affairs and the resolution of a pretty significant uh, challenge and harm that this little one uh, was found within. So um, our, our law in this instance is, is present in this interaction. Now, what does it mean is the other question. That is, how do we look at this case, this story, this example, and draw law from it? Um, I published a couple of books in this regard. The story about the bear is in this book called Laws, Indigenous Ethics. And I talk about our seven grandmother and grandfather teachings, uh, love and honesty, truth, respect, uh, wisdom, humility. Uh, these kinds of things are laws in written constitutionalism as well as unwritten constitutionalism that Anishinaabe people have. But about maybe 12 years ago, and I wrote this other book called Drawing Out Law, A Spirit's Guide, uh, which is the idea that law is present around us to analogize our past situations to present situations or distinguish our present situation from what went before. That is, we look at what's gone on in the past and we, we draw um, close to it or we draw away from it depending on how valuable we think what is present in, the, uh, in, in what is before us. So in this case, what I want to suggest is that this shows the diffuse nature of Anishinaabe law, that it's not just centralized into a hierarchy, but it required a coordination of different people and beings uh, within and beyond our community uh, to be able to bring about the resolution of uh, this harm that was before us. And I could ask you, who does this bear represent? What does the bucket represent in which the bear found its head stuck? What do have, what have those things represent? What does the water represent? What does the boat represent? What does the mother bear represent? Who does the mother bear represent? Who are these people and who do they represent? If we're going to analogize a reason uh, by looking out there in the world that we experience and drawing on it to, to organize our affairs, to uh, understand that we don't just 
engage in the world haphazardly um, by chaos, but in fact, there's a process, there's a civil procedure that I've described to you here, which is a part of our legal uh, tradition. So let me tell you a little bit about some of these people. I know I've only got 10 minutes, uh, so I'll be brief. But who is Nick? Well, the first thing you need to know about Nick, other than he's my cousin, because I'm proud of him, <laughs> is that he's of the Bear Clan. So what's Nick doing? But he's actually watching over our relatives, his relative in particular, and taking care that no harm comes to that bear to which he is related through those clan uh, relationships. So we could say lots about this. Clan and Nishnabimwin is do dame, o dame, o de is heart. It's the heart of who we are, our clans, do dame. Totem is sometimes the way it's talked about, but do dame is the way we say it in Anishinaabemwin. And so he's living by his heart and connecting his heart with that young relative's heart, that, that of his same family, right? That bear is kin, and he's watching out over kin in that way. It's one thing to know about Nick. A second thing to know about Nick is that um, he's elected as the chief counselor under the Indian Act, which means he had the most votes uh, amongst our counselors uh, when we put in uh, our, uh, cast our ballots uh, for him. And so he's exercising some responsibility in that way when he's just living his day-to-day -day life. You don't turn off the fact that uh, I'm only doing band business when I'm sitting at the council table or visiting with government. Right, his responsibilities are there at all times as a part of what he has been invested with by the community, which is a trust to act in a certain way. Another part of this is his ogima. Ogima is our word for chief. Uh, chief means to count your followers. Basil talked about this as agandaso. It's a derivative of that word, and so what he's doing is exercising this responsibility as ogima, which is to not accumulate for yourself, but to serve, to do something for others. And in this case, he was doing this for others, even putting himself in harm's way, right? As I said, uh, he got bitten uh, along the way of doing this. Uh, but he's, he's for this moment in ogima. And, and in another moment with another issue, another person could be the chief of that situation. That is not, there's not a permanent hierarchical chief. The chief depends on the circumstances and when there's a dispute or an issue that needs to be addressed and someone's got tools and resources and trust in that field, they can be that chief. So when Basil Johnson was teaching me about Ogima, he said, you know, we have chiefs who are like the, the coaches of the hockey teams or the baseball teams. And when the hockey game was over, the baseball game was over, that person was no longer Ogima. They were no longer the leader in that situation. Or we used to have three brass bands on our uh, reserve when Basil was younger. And he said the leaders of those bands, whenever the practice was happening or the performance was happening, the leader of that band was Ogima. But when the event was over, just went back into the general population. That is, we have a distributed uh, sense of authority, a diffuse opportunity to exercise our power through Ogima. And so it's a clan responsibility. It's an Indian Act responsibility. It's ogima. It's a, it's, you can draw on our etymology, our language to understand that. It's also important to note that he was exercising his fishing rights this day. He's exercising a constitutional right that we won a case for that recognized our right to be able to commercially fish around Georgian Bay. And, uh, and, but what does that mean when he goes fishing in accordance with our treaty? accordance with the obligations that we made with the crown, it means that you don't just single-mindedly pursue fishing. Or that there's broader ecology that you have to be relating to in that time that you're together. And so those are dimensions of what he's doing. And then, of course, there's these two otters that come along, my daughter and myself, who are there as teachers. That's what otters do often, bring people across a threshold to be able to understand new situations, so we're there. There's Ashley that's there, who's not ethnically 
Indian. He's married in. He's not status, but he became a part of our law there because we had need and he was in a position of responsibility. He brought a tool to be able to help us in that regard. Of course, we also had our police officers there that were a part of uh, this law's unfolding. We even incorporated the Ontario government, a ministry of the Ontario government, into the operation of that law that day as they brought resources at our invitation to be able to deal with this problem, this challenge, this harm that was happening before us. But if you think about who all of these individuals are, you start to get an understanding of how law can be lived. And then if you think of that little bear and you analogize this as to what's happening in our communities with our kids, we need this kind of understanding that law isn't just hierarchical, it's we all get to be legal practitioners. You know, in Anishinaabe Muin and Cree, 70, 80% of the language is verbs, right? Law is something you do. It's not something that's just done to you. It's not just a category like tort or property or contract or constitutional law. It's not just a category. It's not just a noun. It's a verb. Law is something you conjugate, right? It's, it's an action word that, that people get to join with different pronouns and tenses and locations and, and time, right? And, and is that, if you think about that in that way, this story, this law says a lot about our children and what we have that still lives in our communities, our laws, to be able to take account and deal with these harms that we see before us. I know I'm out of time. I'm really appreciative of the time that I have to just be able to speak with you. And I hope that something of relevance comes from this for you. And again, thank you to the Indigenous Law Students Association for your invitation, for the prayers, for the welcome, uh, for the good words. And I hope this gives you some food for thought as uh, you go into the rest of your week. Thank you. That's it. Thank